Hello, Peter. Thank you for doing this. Hello, Tyler. Now, the title of this conversation is Political Theology. That was a phrase, I think, first used by the Russian anarchist Bakunin to mock the Italian nationalist Mazzini. German legal theorist Carl Schmidt then picked it up and said it's something that everyone needs. They, they all need a political theology. What does the term mean to you? Well, it's a, it's a bit of a fuzzy, broad concept, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe sort of uh, to motivate it as a contrast. I, I, I think that in late modernity, we're often living in this world of hyper-specialization where you can't think about the big picture. And it's sort of like, I don't know, it's like Adam Smith's pin factory on steroids. This is sort of our, our world. And, uh, and I, think, I think there is some way that we have to try to integrate all these different um, facets of our life to try to make progress. And that's, that's what political philosophy does. That's what political uh, theology does. Um, the reasons these sorts of things were abandoned, you know, I think I th maybe maybe it's already was like the Enlightenment sort of uh, abandoned it from you know, and you know, one 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 type of reason it was abandoned was because it's too hard to figure this stuff out, or you, it's, it's just a sort of a fool's errand. I'm inclined to think the other reason was that it was often seen as too dangerous, too divisive. You're not supposed to have debates about religion. We settled that in 1648 of the Treaty of Westphalia. We're just going to forget about it and not talk about these things. Um, but And I think that might have been a reasonable compromise in the 18th century. Um, it's my view that when you, you fast forward to the 21st century, it's maybe more dangerous not to think about things. And it's, uh, it's again, more dangerous to go into become a, for us to become ever smaller cogs in an ever bigger machine, you know, a la the, the Adam Smith pin factory. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the political dimension on it, just to say one, one thing on that, is, uh, is there's always sort of a question... Um, you know, if we're trying to figure out something about the whole, about our whole world, you know, do you start on sort of a human scale or do you start on, you know, sort of a microscopic, telescopic, atomic, or cosmic scale? And um, there's probably some way these things are related, but the, you know, the political theology, political philosophy debate, our frame, I think this is also a Socratic idea. We start with sort of turn to common sense, human the world around us, questions about politics, economics, society, culture, um, and that's that, that's sort of actually this important way to get access. You know, there's some deep link between the university and the universe. There's some deep link between the failing multiversity and the um, crazed multiverse. Um, but uh, but we're you know the, the sort of the, the sort of political orientation I have is your. You're never going to solve these things by. Uh, you have to start with the university, or or whatever that's that's gone wrong. Uh, if you're ever going to make sense of the universe, and there's some analog to that that motivates all of these things. Well, let's say I'm trying to make sense of your political theology. So, I recall you saying in a recent talk, you consider yourself religious but not spiritual, and that strikes me as quite a Calvinist point. So, if you put aside predestination and think of Calvinism as insisting we know nothing about heaven. So it's an arrogation of man's power to claim to know about heaven. That's related to your critique of the left. Uh, the notion that we don't know anything about heaven, it also means you can't really be spiritual. That's also a kind of arrogation. Isn't the consistent Peter Thiel really a Calvinist thinker? And Calvinism, it's quite concrete. It's quite serious. It takes governance and authority uh, very literally. Why aren't you just a Calvinist? Man, I like I'm I'm, I'm I'm still like mostly a libertarian, Tyler, and uh, but you can be and both, that's, and that's you know um, I mean I, I think probably there are, there are things I there are probably redeeming things I can find in Calvinism. It's probably you know it's 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 so anti-utopian that it's probably helpful in the battle against communism. But um, you know I don't I don't know if, if uh, that's the only way to be anti-communist. And uh, I don't know if you do five point Calvinism. It's you know. Um, Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. I don't know if I agree with even one out of those those five things. I would say, uh, you know, a, a Girardian anthropological uh, frame is that um, is that you know um, there is this uh, deep link between um, gods and scapegoats, and uh, we tend to always we have these scapegoats. We turn into gods. We uh, project our violence onto them. And this is what, you know, archaic religion does. This is in some ways what, you know, atheist liberalism does. You, you blame everything on Mr. God. And um, isn't Calvinism just 
an extreme form of scapegoating where uh, Mr. God did everything. He determined everything. He's why you're wearing that blue uh, jacket, and it's it's uh, it's why uh, you every, everything you did wrong. It's all Mr. God's fault, and um, it is just it's just sort of uh, we should be deeply distrustful of um, of scapegoating Mr. God for everything like that. So that's that's an anthropological argument against against Calvinism. But the the intel- and then the intellectual reason I'm I'm not Calvinist is that. Uh, I think we should be trying to make sense of the world, and if 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 um, if you are you know if if you're you know so depraved that you can't even think, which is sort of I think a core Calvinist thing, we shouldn't be having a conversation. So if I were if I were a real Calvinist, we wouldn't even be able to have have a conversation here. And uh, and if I you know if I if I sort of you know the, you know the, you know there's a Thomistic distinction between the intellect and the will, and the medievals believe in the power of the intellect, the weakness of the will. Uh, the moderns, it's sort of, in some ways, reversed. But uh, but if you if you sort of take a effective altruist, East Bay rationalist, these people they're they're much closer to Calvinism. They they claim to be rationalists, but if you're in a you know if you're in a rationalist Bible study equivalent, and you know the outward facing thing is that you're rational and you're pure in your in your thinking, the inward facing thing is it's all just spaghetti code. You're so you you can never be right about anything. Maybe you can be a little bit less wrong, but um, it's um, it's that's and so I'm yeah I'm against both Calvinism and um, and uh, so-called rationalism. But here, here's then the puzzle I'm faced with. Let, let's take all of that at face value. Why is it you just don't slide into Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox belief in free will? There's some middle position, and, and why is your middle position stable? You could either be Catholic or, for that matter, Mormon, where there's plenty of room for free will, right? Uh, well, again, these aren't. They're, they're absolutely not not all the all the alternatives. Uh, you know, I have. It's, it's always a little bit of a cheap shot. My 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 two word you know rebuttal to Roman Catholicism is Pope Francis, um, and um, and you know and um, and you know we, we were talking a little bit about you know the you know the uh, you know what what you know I grew up as a Lutheran. Um, you know, there are probably all these things that are you know problematic um, about Luther. There are things that were we're good about him, but you know, I, th- I think the, the you know the one the one part of it that uh, um, if we judge him by the standards of the 16th century, you know, I don't know. Um, I think the Reformation had to come from the outside. It couldn't. It was not actually possible for it to to start from within. And um, and there is a way that uh, you know the Lutheran piece was it was the uh, it was the less globally um, centralized church it was going to be a. It was going to be a, a less centralized church, and there's probably, you know, there's probably still um, some part of the the uh, uh, Protestant political project that lines up more closely with a libertarian view. What is it from the Hebrew Bible, or one could say Old Testament, that you've incorporated into your own political thought? Well, I, th- I think um, I don't know. I, th- I think my views on this are pretty fairly orthodox Christian in that there's some continuity between the old and the new. You know, there's there's some some sense it's sort of hard to define where you know maybe the Christian God is the original progressive, where the new is better than the old. It's the, I think it's the first time where the new is simply better than the old just by virtue of being new. Um, but uh, if you um, if you exaggerate the difference too much, that uh, that ends up being problematic, and that's you know sort of the where you know you end up saying that uh, the Old Testament God is even is like maybe just a different God from the New Testament God. Um, and that uh, you know, sort of all the extremely uh, progressive uh, forms of higher criticism, things like this in the 19th century, were all they were all deeply anti-Semitic. And I th- so I think if you're if you're too progressive, you end up um, becoming an anti-Semite. If you're um, if you and then if you're and then you have to somehow say there's some progress. But uh, the, the the Girardian intuition I would have is it's just always this uh, this this reversal in perspective where. Uh, the Bible takes things from the the, the side of the victim. There, there's a um, and it's, it's already in the book of Genesis where it's the story of Cain and Abel. Um, you know, the founding of the first city in the history of the world is a parallel but opposite story to the story of uh, Romulus and Remus, the founding of the greatest city, where you know Romulus and Remus stories told from the point of view of Romulus, uh, the Cain and Abel stories told from the point of view of Abel, or the you know the Israelites coming out of Egypt that would normally be told from the point of view of the Egyptians, where you had these troublemakers and we got rid of them, and uh, and it's, it it 
and you have this sort of inversion of perspectives um, you know, um, throughout the Old Testament, I would say. Is it possible that we can read the Old Testament, conclude essentially history is something really bad, that's the central message of the woke, and then just say the woke basically are correct, we should side with the woke, they have all these excesses, those are terrible, but they're in a way a method of advertising the fundamental conclusion that history is bad, and they're the ones who make us deal with that, and thus you and I should be woke. What's wrong with that line of reasoning? Yes, I think that history was very bad. I think it's always a mistake for um, conservatives or anti-woke people to whitewash it too much. And so if we if we say that, you know, um, um, you know, yeah, there used to be slavery, but the slaves were all happy people. They were all happy slaves. That is a loser argument. And you should you shouldn't you shouldn't do this. Um, you know, the what I would say, the the again, the sort of rough Christian frame on this is somehow the history is really bad. And I, th- I think Christianity probably, it is much worse than Islam or Judaism on this because, uh, I don't know, you know, Islam and Judaism, it would be inconceivable that you could murder God, you know, uh, in the form of a person. If someone claimed to be God and, and, and he got killed, that would just prove that he's not God. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so sort of the, the original sin, the violence, in some senses, is, is 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 far greater in a Christian context, and then, uh, but then there is some way that we're all part of that matrix, and you also need to have, you know, you need to have forgiveness. So if you if you want to maybe outline three three rough possibilities, there's this, you know, hard to define Christian in between one, which is the history is terrible um, and it's awful, but we need to for, try to find a way to forgive people, and then there is a let's say uh, let's say a woke version where the history is terrible, but um, we're going to forget about the forgiveness part. And then there is, I don't know, maybe, maybe sort of a right-wing Nietzschean Bronze Age pervert alternative, which is uh, we, um, we're just, um, you know, we're going to forget about the history. It's kind of oppressive. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of the skill trip and don't want to hear anything more about the history. And, uh, and somehow the, the, um, the, the sort of in-between Christian one, I, I think, is, is the most tenable, even though there are all sorts of tensions in that. There was a recent Harvard talk you gave where, if I understand you correctly, you suggested the left needed to learn how to relativize its victimhood. What did you mean by that, and how does it relate to what you just said? It's, it's, well, it was in the, the, the context was, uh, you know, how much, how much victimhood is, is, um, is unhealthy for people to have. And, you know, um, yeah, there are all these ways where um, you can... You can Identify yourself as a victim. I'm not, I, I don't want to have sort of blanket rule where you, you can never say that you weren't a victim. You know, I, don't know I, I sometimes like to joke that I'm a poor and persecuted Peter person, and uh, <laughs> and that's uh, maybe there are elements of truth to that. Maybe it's you know maybe it's it's uh, very exaggerated. Um, but if I if I absolutize that too much, it's probably unhealthy and sort of a um, you know, a, a Christian division that I, 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 su- I suggested at the Harvard talk was that uh, if um, it, it's okay to say you're a victim, it's, a, it's okay to do these things up to a certain point, you can't say that you're a greater victim than Christ. And uh, once you do that, um, um, you've probably lost perspective. Are there other holy books besides the Bible that you draw ideas and inspiration from, and what would those be? Well, you know, I, 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 think, I think it's probably all... You know, in some sense, it's all the great books were, you know, were these sort of, I, I don't know, they're, they're not quite, they're not quite at the scale of, of these holy books, we, but, uh, there was, there was a way that, uh, you know, we, we treated, you know, I don't know, Shakespeare or Cervantes or Goethe as these almost semi-divine writers. And, uh, and, uh, that's, and that, I think that's the sort of attitude one has to have to, to, um, read any of these books. You know, appropriately and seriously. So the Western canon would be your answer, so to speak. Something like the Western canon. I don't think that, you know, I don't think the great books are are quite as holy as the Bible. But um, and I, you know, as a result, I I don't probably don't read enough of them. But but yes, that that's that's the closest approximation. And it includes science fiction, yes or no? I, I read a lot as a kid. I'm I, I, I read so little of that nowadays. It's just it's all too depressing. Last week, I was teaching my graduate class, and a bunch of them asked me, why is it we keep on hearing about Carl Schmitt now? And I tried to explain that to them, but 
Why do you think there's now a resurgence of interest in Carl Schmidt? And for you, what are the valuable insights in Schmidt? You know, um, Carl, Carl Schmidt was, uh, he was one of a, sort of this group of uh, thinkers uh, who came to prominence in the 1920s in Weimar, Weimar, Germany. And there was, you know, obviously there were a lot of things that went, you know, very haywire with many of these, uh, many of these people, you know, that sort of, in some ways, uh, Schmidt got somewhat entangled with the Nazis. He distanced himself you know, a few years later, but there were some, it, was, it was some very bad judgment in certain ways. But the, the thing that's, you know, the thing that I think is um, interesting, dangerous about looking at the, the Weimar thinkers, who somehow in the, you know, it was in the aftermath of World War I, Germany had lost. Um, you couldn't go back to sort of the throne and altar, um, you know, empire, the Habsburgs, um, and you couldn't, um, you didn't really want to go forward with liberal democracy. And so there were all these people who had these uh, fairly deep critiques, and in some ways it was going back to these questions of political theology, political philosophy that had been sort of whitewashed and set aside um, since the, uh, since the, uh, since the Enlightenment, um, and and there were again there were things about it that were dangerous. You know, sort of you know one way one way to think of uh, the Weimar period was I don't know it's like the dwarves in Moria where they dwelled too deep and you know finally they they awakened the nameless terror of the Balrog. Um, but uh, but I think I think there are and again I, I don't think we're ever in a cyclical world, but there are certainly certain parallels in the U.S. in the 2020s to Germany in the 1920s where you know. Um, <coughs> You know, liberalism is exhausted. One suspects that democracy, whatever that means, is exhausted, and um, and uh, you know that that uh, we have to ask some questions very far outside the Overton window. What is it you think that Schmidt missed that's very important? Let's let's maybe I'll I'll just sort of do one insight that I think is powerful, and then sort of what's 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 wrong about that. You know, one of one of his books was the concept of the political and sort of. What, what defines politics, and it's sort of this, uh, it's some of this division of friends and enemies, and that, then that, that somehow is really foundational, and you shouldn't get sidetracked with all these other things. And then there are all these interesting ways you could apply this. There's you know, sort of a 1980s Reagan coalition question I always like to ask people, where you had this, the, you know, the Reagan coalition was somehow the free market libertarians, the um, defense hawks, and the social conservatives. And so if you ask, what does the millionaire and the general and the priest, what do they actually have in common? We just sort of imagine these three people are seated at a dinner table and they're having dinner, and what do they actually talk about? And uh, it's really hard to come up with, with an answer, and, uh, and yet the coalition worked incredibly well. And the answer I submit that they have in common is they're anti-communist, and they have a common enemy. And... Um, and that was, you know, incredibly powerful. It was, it was, it was, in some ways, my formative political idea as a teenager, you know, junior high school, high school, late seventies, early eighties, was was anti-communism. Um, and uh, and then there was a way that, you know, when the Berlin Wall came down in eighty nine, this this seemingly incredibly powerful political consolation dis- disintegrated. And and there's and there's sort of a natural Schmidtian analysis of this. So that's. That's sort of, that's sort of where, where I find um, Schmidt quite powerful as a thinker. The, you know, the place um, where uh, it probably tends to always go haywire is there's always a question whether um, politics is like a market um, or is, is, it, is it a sort of thing where if you understand it better, it works better? Um, and, uh, and so, or is it something like a scapegoating machine where... Um, the scapegoating machine only works if you don't uh, look into the sausage making factory. And so, if you say we're having you know a lot of conflicts in our village, and we have to find some um, random elderly woman and accuse her of witchcraft, so that we'll achieve some psychosocial unity as a village, um, this sort of thing doesn't really work if you're if you're that self-aware. And so, uh, and so there was sort of uh, you know Schmidt had this you know in a way had this. Uh, Optimistic enlightenment rationality to it, where if we just describe politics as, you know, the arbitrary division of the world into friends and enemies, then this will somehow, you know, um, strengthen the political, and it probably actually, you know, in some ways, um, 
accelerated its disintegration instead. It's missing out on a certain possible cyclicality in history. So the notion that liberalism will collapse in the Weimar Germany of the 1920s, obviously that was the correct prediction. But if you reappear in West Germany of 1948, it was a completely incorrect prediction. And just as well, liberalism had collapsed leading up to World War I, it, it tends to come back. Uh, why isn't the cyclical perspective the correct one? Man, that's a, that's a big question, but I, uh, I don't know. I, th I think you can, you can stress the, the aspects that are timeless and eternal. Uh, I prefer to stress the aspects that are one-time and world historical. I think that you know, in some sense, every moment in history only um, only happens once, and uh, you know I, th I think there is some kind of a meaning to history. Um, I, I think it has a certain type of linearity to it, um, and if you, um, I, th I think that is sort of the let's say the Judeo-Christian view of history, as distinct from let's say the uh, the classical um, Greco-Roman one. I don't I don't know if you can have a concept of history that's cyclical. And so if you look at um, I don't know. If you look at Thucydides, where um, it's this um, great period of peace that leads to this great war between Athens and Sparta. So the Periclean Age, some of them gives way to this, this great conflict. And then uh, people came back to studying Thucydides right after World War I because there were some certain parallel, you had 100 years of peace between the Napoleonic Wars and then it led to this great conflict. But, um, but there's nothing particular in the history. None of the details matter in Thucydides. He makes up all the speeches and, and so on. And then you, know, you contrast this with something like uh, the book of Daniel in the Bible where it's, um, it's a succession of four kingdoms and it is a one-time world history um, where everything that happens is unique, not, not to be repeated. And, and there's sort of a sense in which I would say the, the, the real first historian was Daniel um, and Thucydides is, isn't even close. Um, and, then, um, and then, yeah, we, you know, we, we, we talked off, off, off the set a little bit about, you know, it was, well, what about you know the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, and isn't the European Union sort of like the Roman Empire? And then I don't know. My my my, my response is well, you know, we have nuclear weapons today, and they didn't have those, you know, even in 1900. And so even just on the science and tech arc, um, things are are so different. And I I would I would not trivialize the importance of science and technology. So you think now the stakes are too high for the cyclical version of history to work? Because at some point it's just not possible to come back. It's just that the, the, the science and tech has a progressive character. And so it is, um, you know, yes, I, I, there, there are elements, I think, that are probably quite apocalyptic about our time, but, but I, I, I wouldn't, um, I, would, I would just start by saying they're, they're very different. And we're, yeah, we're in a very different world than we were in 1900. And I don't know how you go, I don't know how you un, unlearn all the knowledge we've gained even since 1900. Do you think we're entering a new age of millenarian thought, somewhat akin to the English 17th century, where the, everything was very fertile, there's a scientific revolution, tech, you could say, is revitalized again, a lot of people went crazy, uh, highly diverse theologies, uh, they execute a king, many strange things happen, but in, in many ways we're living in the world of the English 17th century, right? With constitutions, political parties, uh, central banks, is this the new oh, this, this, this is again this is again this is again like an absurdly cyclical frame you're you're putting on things it's it's just no i i don't think any moment ever repeats itself it is just radically different um of course there are things that are um you know that are apocalyptic about our world we we have you know we have all these uh kinds of uh dangers that uh, they um unlike the 17th century they seem to come from you know this place that's uh very non-religious it's like science Technology it was you know, nuclear weapons after 1945. You know, it's uh, maybe it's environmental degradation, climate change. We can debate about you know various forms of the environment. There's certainly uh, you know there certainly are fears people have about bioweapons. We can ask what really happened with the Wuhan lab. There are apocalyptic fears um, you know around AI that I think you know des deserve to be uh, ta taken seriously. So if yeah if, if it's if it's millenarian. Um, uh, or apocalyptic, it's uh, it, it has a very very different feel. Um, it is um, it's sort of a apocalyptic violence that comes from a purely human source. It's not it's not really being you know orchestrated by by uh, 
by God. Um, you know, um, uh, the, one of the, one of the, one of the points that Rene Girard always liked to make was that, uh, in the, in the Catholic Church, it was, I think the sort of, um, during the Advent season, you'd often have these sort of sermons on the end times and the terrible things that happened at the end of the world. And, um, in Girard's telling, the church stopped those sermons in, after 1945 because people needed to be reassured that, uh, um, the nuclear weapons had nothing to do with Armageddon or fire and brimstone or or anything like this. Even though, of course, you know there were you know there were all these slight mythic elements. You know, the first nuclear test was called Trinity, or you know you named it after all these Greek gods: the Saturn, Jupiter, Zeus, whatever. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think it's uh, I, th- I think we are we're, we're sort of there. Are, there are elements of that that I think are uh, that are are very true, but. Um, if I had to do my anti-millenarian frame, or um, uh, maybe it's, it's not a pro-tech argument, this is sort of an anti-anti-tech argument, is that uh, you know if, if we if we again talk about all these existential risks um, today, and uh, you know we can nuclear weapons, climate change, biotech, you know nanotech, killer robots, um, the AI that's going to Turn everyone into a paperclip or whatever. Um, um, I always think you have to, you, ha- you should at least include, you know, one more kind of existential risk if we're going to throw it in. And uh, in in my mind, one one other existential risk is a one world totalitarian government. And I find that as least as scary as the others. And um, you know, in the in, in, a, in sort of a uh, biblical eschatological context, uh, you know. You're supposed to worry about Armageddon. You're also supposed to worry about the Antichrist. Maybe you're supposed to worry more about the Antichrist because the Antichrist comes first. Um, and uh, and so, you know, if, if we're going to find a pathway through this apocalyptic age, you have to sort of navigate between the the scylla of all these, you know, existential risks that are and and the charybdis of the sort of political totalitarian uh, catastrophe. If um, if I had to do sort of a more literary version on this you know it's, it's very hard to write sort of a literary account of the antichrist but there were sort of the, the two good antichrist books that were written um the two best fictional ones in my mind were pre-world war one there was a 1908 robert hugh benson sort of a catholic uh, book lord of the world there was a uh, 1900 one by Solovyev, war progress and the end of history and they both had these sort of um accounts of this future totalitarian world dictator who took over the whole world and both of them it's kind of a um, daemonium ex machina. It's sort of really unclear how the Antichrist takes over. It's like he gives these hypnotic speeches and, and no one can remember a word he says, but they all just sell their souls for no apparent good reason whatsoever and he just takes over the world. Um, but it seems to me that if we were to write, if one were to try to write a novel like this post-1945, it's, it's very straightforward. It would be, you know, um, it'd be like one world or none. This was a short film by uh, the nuclear scientists after 1945. If we don't give the nuclear weapons to to the one world government, it's going to blow up the whole world. And um, and basically, um, the 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 literary version would be that the Antichrist comes to power by constantly talking about Armageddon and constantly telling us scary millenarian stories. And so that's that's sort of my complicated, nuanced answer. Is um, there's a lot of truth. Um, to these existential risks, I don't want to completely dismiss them, but uh, but that's also uh, that's also um, you know how we're going to get this uh, totalitarian state. If you look at um, you know there are all these uh, versions of this, I can I can go down, but it's like you know um, it's you know do you want to worry about Doctor Strangelove or Greta? Um, and it seems like Doctor Strangelove is more dangerous, but uh, if if everyone's going to have to you know ride a bicycle. Um, that's not just going to happen on its own, and that requires, you know, some some uh, some real real enforcement of this stuff. Or there's, you know, there's a there's a there's a short, uh, you know, Boston there's a Boston essay from 2019 on how to how to stop all the uh, the the AI risks, and it's basically, you know, maybe maybe we can change the culture so that uh, nobody will have heterodox ideas anymore, and so so, so a few different ideas like this. But then uh, what you really need is. Um, Really effective global government and really effective policing, because uh, you ha- and you have to have some kind of global compute governance, and um, and uh, that sounds to me 
um, at least as scary as the AI. But isn't the much greater risk a collapse into a kind of disorderly feudalism? So we're in Florida. The United States seems to be becoming more federalistic. It's very hard for me to imagine China, say, taking over India. You can look at the Balkans. It's even a word, Balkanized. You look at the Middle East. If it goes very badly, it's hard to see any single power just ruling any substantial part of the Middle East. It's easy to imagine it being in a kind of chaos. Uh, why think there's so much scale that that kind of totalitarianism would be possible? Man, I, I don't. I don't know. It's it's uh, it's uh, there's so many different versions of this. But just if you, if we think about, um, I don't know the the. There were, there were versions of this I would have been more on your side, let's say post 9 11. You know, it was, you know, wow, aren't we just going to have all this chaotic terrorism all over the world? And, uh, and we didn't get that much terrorism, and we instead got, you know, uh, the Patriot Act and, um, you know, incredible tracking of, you know, of money flows, incredible monitoring of people. And, uh, and so the, you know, um, and of course, you know, there's still, there still are things that can go wrong, but, but, uh, you know, the, the political slogan of the Antichrist, uh, first Thessalonians 5-3, I think, is, uh, is peace and safety. And, um, it seems that we've gone far more in the peace and safety direction than the, the global chaos direction. I, I don't know, it's, it's, I don't, th- I think it's hard to even have a, like an illegal Swiss bank account. And that's like a really <laughs> modest, modest way. It's, 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 you know, um, it's, it's hard to exit. It's hard, it's much harder to exit the United States than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Let's say you're trying to track the probability, uh, that the Western world and its allies somehow muddles through and just keeps on muddling through. What variable or variables do you look at to try to track or estimate that? What do you watch? I, I don't, I don't think it's a really empirical question. So this is, it's, it's, if, if, um, yes, if you could convince me that it was empirical and you'd say these are the variables we should pay attention to, if I, if I could, if I agreed with that frame, you've already won half the argument. And so it'd be like variables, well, you know, the sun has risen and set every day, and so it'll probably keep doing that, and so we shouldn't worry. Or, you know, the planet has always muddled through, so Greta's kind of wrong, and, um, it, you know, uh, and we shouldn't really pay attention to her. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to not paying attention to her, but I, I don't think this is a great argument. And, um, and uh, or, you know, this, this is, of course, if, if we think about the, the globalization project of, 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 of you know, of, of, of the post-Cold War um, period, where um, in some sense it's, you know, globalization is just sort of happens. There's going to be more movement of goods and people and ideas and, and money. And um, we're going to sort of become this, uh, you know, more peaceful, um, better integrated world. And um, you don't need to sweat the details. We're just going to kind of muddle through. And then what, you know, in my telling, you know, there are a lot of things around that story that that um, went very haywire. Um, you know, one one simple version is the the U.S. China thing hasn't quite worked the way people in Fukuyama and all these people envisioned it back in 1989. Um, and um, and I think one could have figured this out much earlier. And um, and if, if if we had not been told, you you can just you're just going to muddle through. Um, uh, it would it you know the alarm bells would have gone off much sooner. And uh, you know uh, you know may, maybe maybe globalization is leading towards you know sort of a neoliberal paradise. Maybe it's leading to the totalitarian state of the Antichrist. But um, I would be yeah I'd be Let's see, it's a, not a very empirical argument, but, but if someone like you didn't ask questions about muddling through, I'd be so much like an optimistic boomer libertarian like you, uh, stopped asking <laughs> questions about muddling through, um, I'd be so much more assured. So are you so much more hopeful. Are you saying it's ultimately a metaphysical question rather than an empirical question? I, I, don't, I don't think it's metaphysical, but it's, it's somewhat analytic. It's, a- and it's, moral even. It's... It's that you're laying down some duty by talking about muddling through. Well, I, it, it's it's um, it, it it does tie into all these these bigger questions. So I think um, I, I don't I don't think if we had you know a one world state that this would automatically 
be for the best. And so uh, there are, you know, there are, uh, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, if we do a classical liberal or libertarian intuition on this, it would be, you know, maybe, maybe um, the absolute power that a one world state would have would corrupt absolutely. I don't think the libertarians were critical enough of it the last 20 or 30 years. So there was some way um, they didn't believe their own theories. They didn't connect things enough. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd say that's a moral failure, but there was some failure of the, of the imagination. So this multi-pronged skepticism about muddling through, would you say that's your actual real political theology? Like, have we gotten to the bottom of this now? It, th- that would be that would be a, a you know it's 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 whenever people think you can just muddle through, um, yeah, that you're you're probably set up for some kind of disaster. That's that that's fair. I, I mean, it doesn't. It, it's not like not as positive an agenda, but but I always I always think you know I, I don't know as, as a, as a you know, it's one of my chapters in, in the zero to one book was, was, you know, you're not a lottery ticket. And it's sort of like the, the, the basic advice is if you're, if you're an investor and, you know, you can just think, okay, I'm just muddling through as an investor here. I have no idea what to invest in. There are all these people. I don't, I can't pay attention to any of them. I'm just going to write checks to everyone, make them go away. And uh, I'm just going to set up, you know, um, a desk somewhere here in, uh, on South Beach. And I'm going to give a check to everyone who comes up to the desk or, uh, you know, not everybody, but it'll, I'll just, uh, it'll, it's just I'm writing lottery tickets. And that's just a formula for losing all your money. And, um, and there's some, there's some, anal- the, the muddling, the, the, the place where I react so violently to the muddling through is it's just, it's, again, we're, we're just not thinking. And this is like, it's, it's, it can be Calvinist, it can be, it can be rationalist, it's, it's anti intellectual, it's, it's not thinking about things. So the muddling through view and the Calvinist view, it- in your opinion, they have the same flaw, actually. It's uh, a distrust in human agency, a distrust in human thought, a distrust, you know, in our ability to, uh, yeah, to, to make choices. Now, for months, I've been asking myself why you and also Schmidt are so interested in this catacon idea, which is also from the Bible. Uh, you can explain that to us in a moment. But am I correct in now thinking? It just occurs to me that the catacomb is, in a sense, your substitute vision for what, for me, is muddling through. So you're not willing to believe in muddling through, but things haven't collapsed now, not here. So you need something else holding the finger in the dike, and that's catacomb, or no? Or no. Uh, well, it's, it's a very mysterious idea. I'm not, it's, it's sort of this, uh, this um, there's always a question why the Antichrist hasn't taken over yet, and it's this mysterious force that holds back, this restraining force that that holds back, you know, the totalitarian one world state. And, um, and, uh, you know, I don't necessarily put too much stock in it because it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, on its own terms, it's somewhat unstable. It's, um, it's provisional. It has these sort of, um, archaic sacred elements. It can, it can work for a while. It's, um, but it's not something, uh, it's not a, you can't identify it with an, Institution, it, it, you know, and again, the, the Schmidtian view is there were all these different things that played the role of the catacon at various points in time. But uh, and if you're not supposed to immanentize the eschaton, you're also not supposed to immanentize the catacon. And um, and so if you if you uh, if you identify too much as one thing, that can go very wrong. And then um, if you if you think of the catacon as the thing that restrains the one world state. Um, um, there were, you know, there were various things, or, or that restrains the Antichrist. Um, anything that's sort of like the opposite, this is sort of a Girardian cut, is always going to be mimetically entangled, and so it's going to have sort of this parallelism. And so there's always a risk that the catacomb becomes the Antichrist. And so, the, you know, the, the, the original anti, the proto Antichrist was Nero. Claudius, the, the good emperor, was the catacomb. He was restraining Nero, but then at some point, you know, it's yeah, Nero's the opposite of Claudius, but they're both. They're both uh, Roman emperors, or, um, or you know, you could say that um, you could say that um, in the middle of the 20th century, I don't know, from let's say 1949 to 1989, I would identify the catacomb as anti-communism. I would identify communism as the ideology of the Antichrist in the 20th century, and anti-communism was this, you know, it was not you know, what what stopped communism was not. You know, the United States couldn't have done it. It was not just one country. It was not. Um, it was not like some 
libertarian debating society was, you know, something was like pretty violent, pretty, pretty hard to morally justify, not really that Christian, um, but, um, but w- that, that sort of had this unifying effect. And then um, the way it morphed would be in, in 1989, something like anti-communism morphs into neoliberalism, and that's actually, you know, uh, well, if you're anti-communist, you're not aspiring for world control. You're just trying to stop the communists from getting world control. Once you've defeated the communists, what are you supposed to do? And like, maybe you can just go home and forget about all, all, all of what you did. But in practice, these things have a tendency to perpetuate themselves. And it was like Bush 41, anti-communism became the new world order. And we're now going to just govern the world in the name of anti-communism. And, uh, and so there's something about it that's always uh, misleading. Or, or even what I said about the Antichrist in this apocalyptic thing. Doesn't the Antichrist just come to power by acting as a catacomb? Like, this is what Greta says she's doing. She is the catacomb stopping climate change. And, um, and so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a somewhat useful concept, but um, I wouldn't put too much weight on it. So at, at the macro level, uh, all the weight you're putting on human agency, is that really so compatible with Lutheranism? I'm, I'm probably not. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not a perfect Lutheran. Not a I mean, perfect there's a, a lot. A lot. There's a lot that was. If you look at all these, all these people, that one would judge very differently in retrospect. If you look in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and you think about all the Christian thinkers who believed in some form of predestination, or Moses was, was chosen and the like, uh, Abraham was chosen. What is it in the Bible that points you in the direction of so much belief in human agency being so important? And there's sort of a lo- lot of different levels on this but uh but certainly um if you uh if you if you think of it as as um this this shift away from um uh sacrificing individuals uh, sacrificing people um there there is sort of an anti the anti sacrificial theme and you know we can you know you can always say how is you know modernity or enlightened values how how are they t- tied with this but uh um, certainly, the the idea I would have would be some, something like the idea of the individual came out of this this context where you know um, um, the state was not absolute, it was not 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 sacred, it, it um, you know it was not necessarily providential. Um, you know, this is always uh, G- Girard liked to always say that um, you know uh, Christ was the first political atheist because on the on the level of of the uh, of the political order. If, if you say um, Christ says that he's the son of God, son of the Father, um, there's a way you can go into Trinitarian metaphysics. But the uh, the political interpretation of this is that Caesar Augustus, um, uh, the son of the divinized Caesar, is not um, that is is, is not um, you know the, somehow that's not exactly the son of God, and uh, that the Roman Empire is not simply divinely ordained, and then that's somehow you know, op- opens a space for, for um, you know, a less a less unitary system that you know takes you know many many centuries to develop or something like this. But this is where I don't know. I I, I think of you know I, I think of even Ayn Rand is like a pretty good Christian in this way. I know that would probably be a really I wonder scandalous what thing say to, to say. That. <laughs> but it's it's just it's at least you know yeah it's, it's Jewish and atheist and shrill and crazy. But it's but it's 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 just. No, you can't sacrifice the individual, and and then um, and then you know you you shouldn't sacrifice your mind. You shouldn't sacrifice your reason. It's just that you can't you can't sacrifice that. You've been quoting the Tempest lately in some of your talks. How is it you think the Shakespearean political vision differs from the Christian? Well, it's always it's always hard to know what. Uh, um, what Shakespeare really thought, but I, 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 I um, you know, you, have, you certainly have different characters. If you have, you know, I think it's, um, you know, um, you have someone like Macbeth, I think, says life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So um, that doesn't sound like a particularly Christian worldview, but maybe you know, that's just what Macbeth says. It's not what Shakespeare says. So it's always, it's always very hard to know. How, or maybe it's a sort of a Christian nihilistic view of the world or something, something like that. Um, 
but um, but I think the 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 contrast I always frame is that uh, I think I think sh- um, uh, the way I understand Shakespeare is always in contrast with someone like Karl Marx, where um, Marx believed that people had battles over differences that mattered. It was you know the different classes and they had objectively different interests, and this is what led to the intensity of the the struggle. And there's something in um, Shakespeare that's sort of proto-Girardian or very mimetic, where um, people have conflicts over um, when they uh, the conflicts are the most intense when they don't differ at all. And so it is, you know, it's the opening line of Romeo and Juliet. It's uh, the Capulets versus the Montagues, two houses alike in dignity. They're identical, and that's why they they hate each other so much. Or I think it's at the end of Hamlet where. Hamlet says, you know, to be truly great, you must stake everything for an eggshell because, um, because an average person would fight over things that mattered, but a truly great person would fight over things as ephemeral as honor or an eggshell or something, something like this. And, um, and of course, you know, the Hamlet's problem is he doesn't really, um, believe all, all the, you know, the, the sort of insane revenge drama he's, he's supposed to, he's, he's supposed to be in. Um, so I think, I think there is probably a, um, a place where I would I would say, uh, yeah, Shakespeare would probably be very distrustful of you know um, extreme ideological differences today. Uh, would probably, in some ways, also be be a kind of uh, political atheist. I find the play Julius Caesar very interesting because there's no catacon, there's no muddling through, so they sacrifice Caesar. There's a civil war and a lot more people dying, and no end to that in sight. It's the the pessimistic scenario of the teal mental universe, I think. You know, there's, there's sort of a strange way where, where they're, they're all going back and thinking they're, they're reenacting things, right? So it's, uh, it's, um, it's um, you know, the way uh, Brutus uh, gets pulled into the conspiracy in Julius Caesar is that uh, he, um, he gets reminded or he, that, you know, his ancestor, another person named Brutus, had overthrown Tarquin, the, the last of the kings of Rome in 509 B.C., and so he thinks he's he's just you know reenacting that murder, and then of course there's a you know there's a um, and then I think I think there is uh, some part in the in the in, in the in the play where um, 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 the Shakespeare has the actors say you know I'm going to get get this slightly garbled, but it's something like um, you know and uh, centuries hence there'll be people reenacting this on a stage in front of an audience and 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 this is what motivates Brutus to do it. It's like the the future applause in the Shakespearean uh, theater. And then, of course, you know the uh, the crazy literal reenactment of it was um, John Wilkes Booth shooting Abraham Lincoln in 1865, where uh, um, you know um, Booth uh, was a Shakespearean actor, and then it was six semper tyrannis was what he said. It was like he, was, he thought he was reenacting the Brutus Caesar thing, and then you can you can look at the. Uh, I think it's 1838 Lincoln speech, the Young Men's Lyceum Address, where um, Lincoln sort of portrays himself as, um, sort of in a somewhat coded way as sort of a proto Caesar, where you know they and he sort of tells the audience they're they're people in this country who um, you know who um, wouldn't be happy to be you know there are all these there's some people who are like really ambitious and uh, um, but no one could be like a founder um, because that was in the past. And the most you can now be is a president. But there are people for whom being president's not enough. And there's some people who, um, if you didn't stop them, they would keep going until they enslaved all the white people or freed all the slaves. This is sort of Lincoln talking about himself and saying that he has the ambition to be like a Caesar or a Napoleon or or something like this. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's sort of there's a bit of a roundabout answer. So um, yes, yeah, so there are ways we can see it as a as a cycle. But but surely that's what we want to transcend. It was, it was a bad idea for Brutus to think he was reenacting the Caesar thing, and somehow um, there was something about uh, the John Wilkes Booth story that's pretty sad, too. For our last segment, let's turn to artificial intelligence. As you know, large language models are already quite powerful. They're only going to get better. In this world to come, will the word sales just lose their influence? People who write, people who play around with ideas, pundits... Are they just toast? What's this going to look like? Are they going to give up power peacefully? Are they going to go down with the ship? Are they going to um, set man, off I, nuclear bombs? I, I, you know, I, I, I sort of, I had this riff where I, I, I think, again, sort of the, one of the things, the, I'll, I'll say the, the AI thing broadly, the LLMs, it's a big breakthrough. It's very important. Um, 
And it's striking to me how, um, how bad Silicon Valley is at talking about these sorts of things. And, uh, and uh, they're, they're sort of, you know, they're sort of all kinds of, the questions are either way too narrow, where it's something like, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have, um, uh, you know, are, is the next transformer model going to improve by 20% on the last one or something like this? Or they're maybe too cosmic, where it's like we go straight, from there we go straight to the simulation theory of the universe. And, uh, and surely there are, you know, a lot of um, in-between questions one, one could ask. Um, let me try to answer uh, yours. I'll, I'll, um, um, my, my intuition would be it's going to be quite the opposite, where it seems much worse for the math people than the word people. Um, and what, you know, what people have told me is that, uh, um, you know, they, they think within three to five years, um, the AI models will be able to solve all the, um, U.S. math Olympiad problems. And, um, and, uh, that would, you know, that would, um, that would shift things, uh, things quite a bit. Um, there, there's sort of a longer history I always have on the math versus verbal, uh, riff where, if you ask when did um, ma- when did our society bias to uh, testing people more for ver- a math ability, I believe it was during the French Revolution because it was believed that uh, verbal ability ran in families. Um, math ability was sort of distributed um, in the sort of idiot savant way throughout the population, and so if we um, if we prioritized uh, math ability, um, it had sort of this meritocratic but also egalitarian uh, effect on society. Um, and then I, I think by the time you get to the Soviet Union and Soviet communism in the 20th century, where you give um, you know a, um, a number theorist or chess grandmaster a medal, which I, was always a part I was somewhat sympathetic to in the in the uh, Soviet Union, um, 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 you um, it, maybe it's actually just sort of a control mechanism where the math people are singularly clueless. They don't understand anything. But if we um, put them on a pedestal, we tell everyone else you need to be like the math person. Then um, it's actually a way to sort of control, or that the chess grandmaster doesn't understand anything about the world. Um, that's a way to to really control things. And if I sort of fast forwarded to let's say Silicon Valley in the early 21st century, it's way too biased towards the math people. I don't know if it's a French Revolution thing or a Russian uh, sort of um, Straussian uh, secret cabal control thing, where you have sort of pr- pr- prioritize, it. but. Uh, but that's that's the thing that seems deeply unstable, and uh, that's what I would bet on on getting reversed. Where you know it's like, isn't it like um, like and the, the the place where math ability, like you know, um, you know, it's it's sort of it's the thing that's the test for everything, right? It's like if you want to go to medical school, okay, we weed people out through uh, physics and calculus, and like I'm not sure that's really correlated with your. You know, I don't know, your dexterity as a neurosurgeon. I don't really want someone operating on my brain to be, you know, doing prime number factorizations in their head while they're <laughs> operating on my brain or something like that. And so, um, you know, I, 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 when, you know, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, I, I had a sort of a chess bias because I was a pretty good chess player. And so my chess bias was you should just test everyone on chess ability. And that should be the gating factor. Why, why even do math? Why not just chess? And that got, Undermined by uh, by the computers in 1997, and, um, and isn't that what's going to happen to math? And isn't that a long overdue rebalancing of our society? And how is manual labor going to do in this world to come? There'll be a lot more new projects, right? If you're a very good gardener, carpenter, will your wages go up by five x, or is there something else in store for us? It's it's hard to say, but I look. I think I. It seems to me the kinds of let me just not give the answer, but let me sort of suggest some of the questions I'd like us to focus on more with the AI. So I think, yeah, I think one question is, you know, is it going to, how much will it increase GDP versus how much will it increase inequality? And probably it does, does some, some of both. Um, um, is it a very centralizing technology? That's another question I'd like to get a better handle on. Um, you know, I, I had this riff five, six years ago where if, um, if crypto is libertarian, why can't we say that AI is communist, um, and that it, and um, and and one of the things that I, I I'm still probably a little bit uncomfortable about it is that it, it seems to lead to these incredible returns to scale. You know, um, man, I thought I thought still, you know I thought San Francisco had at least you know committed suicide, and we could move on from San Francisco, <laughs> and then um, but the uh, the returns to scale on AI are so big that uh, 
may, maybe even San Francisco will will survive with um, with uh, the AI revolution. But then you know there are, and there are benefits to this, but but it also leads to um, th this kind of a, a set of centralization questions or the geopolitical question. You know, um, you know if if it is as big a technology as you and I think it is, um, what is it going to do to the China U.S. rivalry? Will it you know? And what do you think? Um, I, I don't actually, I, I'm just saying, like, it would be good if we just at, at least asked the right sorts of questions. I don't have answers to all these. My, um, I, I can do the, I'll do the pro-China argument is they, um, they will not hesitate to use the AI and uh, train it on all their people. And so um, it'll be more quickly implemented. The uh, pro-US argument is that, uh, is that we are probably ahead of China. Maybe the large language models are not really communist. You know, maybe if, if you can't ask the, large language model, who Winnie the Pooh is. Uh, you have to nerf it so badly that it doesn't even work or something like that. So I, I, I think there's sort of a, um, there's an intuition that the effect of altruists are not just fifth columnists on the part of the CCP where they're trying to sabotage us, but where they actually simply are uh, uh, um, um, doing what the CCP wants, uh, which is actually to stop the LLMs and the, that it's very disruptive. Um, and then... Um, to the extent, I think, that the second one, that it probably helps the U.S. more than China, um, is that actually massively destabilizing, where um, you know China was this sort of low volatility plan to victory, where they were just going to slowly uh, beat the Western world. Um, and if, if, if you now have this uh, volatility increasing technology that China cannot match, does that just accelerate China's timetable? And does China become sort of like Russia, where, you know, you're ultimately going to lose, and you have to, you know, maybe you have to invade Taiwan in the next year or two, and you can't wait for another decade. Final question. What is the next thing you will choose to learn about? Man, this is always, <laughs> these are all these questions, you know, this is all, they're all these projections of your personality, Tyler, you know, it's like, <laughs> and it's the Isaiah Berlin thing where, you know, um, you have these two, you have these sort of, uh, you know, the, the hedgehog who knows one thing, the fox who knows many things. You know so many different things. You're interested in so many different things. You know, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, it's just sort of a few core ideas I come back to, and it's, it's something like this, uh, you know, wonderful and terrible history of the world that we're living through as, you know, um, you know Christianity's unraveling our culture, and we have to figure out a way to get to the other side, and I think that's what's going to keep me busy for a long time. Peter Thiel, thank you very much. We now have time for questions. Yes. Hello. Um, it's, it's kind of a basic question maybe to you, but to me I'm wondering your opinion. You have this dystopic view of like one world order, which I totally understand. And I know that Founders Fund has invested in cryptocurrency and made money on it, but do you view crypto or Bitcoin in particular as something that could put power back in the hands of the people or something that's likely to catalyze uh, more, more centralization of power in this one world order in the future? I st I'm still hopeful that on net, um, Bitcoin is on the anti one world order side just based on all the people who are against it. But maybe that's a little bit too of a simplistic Schmidtian analysis. Um, but uh, yeah, no, um, there are, uh, the, the, the questions are, you know, the, the sort of questions would be, can you, um, can you uh, do you have genuine um, anonymity, genuine pseudonymity, um, and probably there are certain ways in which, you know, if we want to have decentralized things where um, you use money for questionable purposes, you know, maybe maybe physical cash is still better than Bitcoin and, and things have not gone in quite the uh, sort of, um, I don't know, crypto-anarchist utopia that people were, were fantasizing about in the, in, the, in, the, in, the late, in the late 90s. On, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, I... I think it probably is still, um, you know, if, 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 if you're just, you know, thinking of it as a, you know, one time way to get money outside of the control of a particular government, it's probably still extremely good for that. Thank you. So you Next can hodl, hodl until you need it. Next question. 
Uh, so Nick Bostrom and uh, communism both sort of start out with a very different premise, end up in the same place, we need a one world government. Do you think that there's some sort of metaphysical reason for that, some kind of attractor well there? No, I, th I think there's a, there's a certain rationality to it. If, if, if we, maybe, maybe just an enlightenment rationality where if we, if we say that, uh, there's, you know, some set of things that make sense and, uh, that are good and then, you know, it's, it's, it's probably, there's some kind of a way you should have, in you know, a world order. It sounds more peaceful in both cases than having, you know, a divided world. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, there's probably just some kind of, um, some kind of a rationality where, um, if you had one modality of governance, that would, uh, if it's the best, that would make for the best possible world. And you should, you should have that everywhere. And then, um, and then if you have, it's only if you have, you know, some very deep concerns about, you know, um, maybe human nature or the people who run the government or things like that, that, uh, you start to second guess that. They're, pro they're probably both, you know, somehow pretty optimistic about human nature. Hi. Uh, if one extra year at the end of your life was for sale, what would you be willing to pay for it today? <laughs> Man, I, 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 I don't, I don't agree with hypothetical questions where I don't believe in the premise. I, I, I would, uh, I would, uh, probably not pay the person who asked me that anything because I think they were just ripping me off since it's, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I you know, it'd be, I, I hope to live for more than just one more year. And, uh, by the time I needed to collect on that extra year, I think that person will be long gone. All right, cool. Thanks. What are the Straussian messages of the Bible, and what do they tell us about political theology? Simple questions tonight. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, I think, um, well, I think uh, Str Strauss was this uh, political philosopher who's, you know, I wouldn't describe as Christian, was probably sort of uh, very, very classical. Um, but the, the place where I'd say both, let's say someone like Strauss and Girard agreed on was that there, there's certain ways of understanding the world that um, um, have this disruptive way. And, you know, you don't want enlightenment simply. That if you, uh, if you just tell people the secret messages, um, it, it has this sort of unraveling effect. And so the I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure it's esoteric, but it is. Um, you know, um, it's the Book of Revelations is the apocalypse because um, you know apocalypse in Greek means unveiling, and um, and it is. Um, and if you unveil the social order, you um, you um, you you might end up um, you know deconstructing and uh, destroying it. And uh, you know this is or you know one of Gerard's book was. Um, um, I see Satan fall like lightning, and it's sort of to see Satan is to see Satan fall. And so the the only time Satan appears in the Bible is at the very end of the world. Every other time, it's maybe he's talking to God or he's talking to Christ in the desert. But no human being ever sees Satan simply because to see Satan is um, to see Satan fall. You know, it's sort of the you know the, there's sort of the libertarian you know another libertarian cut on Christianity is that. Uh, you know, when Christ is tempted in the desert and Satan says, just worship me and you can have all these kingdoms in the world, it's, uh, it's somehow saying that all the governments are more satanic than divinely ordained. And, um, and then people don't understand that. They think the gov governments are somehow divinely ordained. And so when, once you see how satanic the government is, how satanic taxes are, other things besides the governments do, um, um, it, it will have this unraveling effect. Thank you. Hi. Um, a big part of the thesis of the sovereign individual is that uh, the defenders will be able to have an advantage over offense and that that's the way that violence and the exertion of force is going. Um, I'm interested if you still think that to be the case, particularly with uh, companies like Anduril, where the thesis is kind of there is no inherent properties of a smaller weapon that a smaller state can easily have, but rather the proliferation of those is simply a tactic that larger states need to use to evolve their strategies. Yeah, so I, I was extremely influenced by the um, Reese Mock Davidson book, uh, 1997, The Sovereign Individual, where um, um, and, and the, where the thesis was that, uh, uh, let's say, the computer technology information age was trending in this very deeply decentralizing libertarian way. 
And uh, that seemed yeah, that seemed very true in 1999, and then certainly by um, the last, you know, the, by the end of the 2010s, one would have said that uh, um, there's something about a, a lot of information t technology that seemed you know, maybe centralizing, maybe uh, may maybe the opposite. There's always a riff I have in this where you know if, if we look at uh, there's a you know a Star Trek or you know the world of 1968, people also thought. Um, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey, so IBM is how, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of you're going to have one big supercomputer that's going to run a planet or the planet Beta in one of the early Star Trek episodes where there's one big supercomputer that runs the planet. And the inhabitants are sort of these uh, docile, robot-like people who've been living peacefully but uneventfully for 8,000 years. And then, of course, as always, the uh, Star Trek people, you know, don't follow the prime directive and blow up the computer and then leave, leave the planet. Um, but... Um, but that was you know, the future of the computer age in the late 60s was highly centralized. By the late 90s, was very decentralized. You know, by the late uh, 2010s, maybe crypto accepted. It was again seemed to be pushing back to centralization. Um, I don't know. My 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 intuition is these things are not you know absolutely written in stone, and it's up to us to work on you know making the technologies happen to push it one way or the other. As a follow it's up, not quite that predetermined. Would you bet on open source AI? I, if decentralization is great, it should have more dynamic properties, should innovate more, should be safer, has many other virtues. I don't quite know if that's the, the main variable that's going to push the centralization or decentralization with it. But yeah, that, there, there probably is some version of it that, that would be helpful. I, I don't know, the Linux versus Microsoft precedent, not sure that Change anything that much on the on the level of the operating system. Thank you. When do you think humans are going to destroy themselves, and do you think AI is going to do it? I I I, I don't think I don't think these things are uh, written in in stone. I, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a I'm not a P Doom a, a, a EA East Bay rationalist. I, I think it's it's up to us. Um, but uh, but as I said, I'm 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 much more worried about um, the humans um, trying to stop the AI than the AI destroying us. You know, it, like a, you know, a force that's powerful enough to stop the AI is probably a force that's powerful enough to destroy the world too. So I would I want to worry more about the humans that are trying to stop the AI. Um, Ayan Hirsi Ali recently converted to Christianity, but it seems mostly for utilitarian reasons. Um, something like for the great civilizational war, because secularism doesn't provide a good enough answer. Do you see religion as mainly a utility in the postmodern world? You can have you can have utilitarian elements. I, I don't think one can ever stress those too much. And so my, my bias is always to focus more on you know, questions of truth. Uh, you mentioned Lincoln's Lyceum address, where he talks about that towering genius figure, and I'd never heard before that he thought. Did you think at the time he thought he was the towering genius and? Do you approve of Lincoln's political religion or view for America? Well, I, th I think it's a very it's a very fascinating speech because um, he, he references some some Caesar or Napoleon like figure who will enslave the white people or free the slaves, and so that seems like it's, it seems plausible to think that he was thinking of himself. I have a question about your personal life, if I may, and if possible, if you could give your answers a story, that'd be lovely. Obviously. Um, you feel a great sense of personal responsibility, indeed responsibility to history. Um, how did that sentiment begin? How has it evolved? Sort of what have you found to be the more fruitful and less fruitful avenues for expressing it? Oh, I'm always so bad at, at doing a <laughs> self-psychoanalysis or something <laughs> like that. Um, I don't know. The, you know, the, the, there were sort of all these ways I was... You know, I, I was like incredibly competitive and tracked as a kid. You know, my eighth grade, junior high school yearbook. One of my friends said, "I know you're, you're going to get into Stanford in four years." I got into Stanford, and I went to Stanford. And I went to law school. I ended up, you know, at a top law firm in Manhattan. From the outside, it was a place um, where everybody wanted to get in. On the inside, it was a place everybody wanted to get out. And um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of had some kind of a quarter life crisis in my mid twenties. And, uh, you know, it's, it was, you know, un, un, unclear what, what, what to do, but s somehow, um, you, 
um, you, you can't, uh, you, you have to try to avoid the worst mimetic entanglements, the, the worst forms of mimetic competition possible. It's, uh, I, I don't, I don't think one, you know, I, I don't think psychology really works. I don't, I don't think sort of awareness of these things is, is quite, quite the way to, to do it. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, there was, there was some, 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 some part of that that was very important for me. Thank you. So uh, to that point, to get people off of the mimetic track, I think um, you know Teal Fellowship was really amazing and has had tremendous success. Have you thought about trying to scale that in a way that might be profitable or could make a larger impact than say twenty folks a year and maybe twenty thousand eventually? We've thought about scaling it a lot of times. It's it's probably quite quite hard to to scale. It's always you know the the sort of the paradox of something like the Teal Fellowship or my Zero to One book or any, any sort of self help thing is like you know, um, it's it's always bad to just sort of give advice where okay these are the things you're supposed to do, because it's sort of like um, and so, um, the, I, I I I worry that uh, trying to scale things it, you know the only way you can scale things is by somehow automating them mechanizing them turning into them into more of a cookie cutter type process and then um, I always worry that that uh, deranges it at scale you know, so somehow you know it's you know it's, I, I don't have like a I can't give it people a formula what to do it's something like well you should think for yourself and figure it out and then but then um, if I try to to scale that it's like I don't know it's like some kind of I don't know Maoist little red book or something you're producing and that's <laughs> it's quite the opposite thank you Peter, my question is about diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, DEI has become very prevalent in corporate America, and uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on whether you're seeing this in some of the early stage companies also, like the companies that Founders Fund is investing in. And what are your thoughts? Do you think this is something positive? Are you neutral? Or you think this has gone a little over the top? Would love to know your views on that. You know, I'm 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 very against it. I don't always know if it's the most important issue, either. So somehow, uh, you know, I, I I wrote a book as an um, after my undergraduate years entitled "The Diversity Myth," and it was sort of focusing on a lot of the um, craziness, the campus wars, culture wars that were taking place at uh, Stanford in the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, there are parts of it that seemed very prescient, and uh, it sort of Know, described a, a lot of things that eventually spread to the broader culture. On another level, it was like a completely ineffective book where the arguments didn't matter. Um, and uh, and uh, what 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 drove these things somehow was was on a on a very uh, very different level. I think um, I think the and then, you know if, if we think about the you know the woke corporation in in Silicon Valley. It seems unhealthy if a company is is um, leaning too much into into the DEI narratives. It, um, but you know, there always are there probably are Machiavellian ways where this can also work, where it sort of you know just distracts people. So there's uh, you know I don't know Walmart was sort of the proto woke company in the 2000s, and they were constantly being attacked by the labor unions because they were um, you know they weren't paying their workers enough. And then, uh, you know, they could, okay, they could pay their workers more or they could uh, rebrand themselves as a green, environmentally friendly company. And that turned out to be a very cheap way to split up the, um, the, um, left wing anti Walmart coalition. And, uh, and so that was a version of it as, um, I don't know, as this sort of capitalist, um, conspiracy, um, against it. And then there, you know, there are cases where that can work and cases where it can go wrong. Um, for the most part, I, uh, I think that uh, you know, it's 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 just a distraction from more important things, and so there's 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 you know there's one level on which I find the issues very silly. Uh, there's another level where where it's evil because it's stopping us from paying attention to more important things, and uh, and it, you know it's, it's things like the economy, like science and tech, or even these these broader religious questions that we've 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 talked about today. I don't know. I I, I, I there's sort of a you know. Um, People always talk about it in terms of cultural Marxism, but I, th I think um, you know I think a real Marxist would be much preferable to a uh, d diversity person. If, if Rosa Luxemburg, who's uh, you know sort of this 
uh, crazed communist from the early 20th century. It was like, you know, I think one thing she said was, there can be nobody more revolutionary than a factory worker. That nobody can be more revolutionary than a proletarian. And so um, a diversity officer in a university or corporation, what would Rosa Luxemburg think of this? It would be in the same category as a bank robber or a prostitute, as someone who's just uh, an extremely um, corrupt form of crony capitalism. Thank you so much. There's a fair amount of variation in regulation on biotech. Um, you know, there's Prospera, you funded some sea setting places. What's your sense for why there aren't crazy, cool, ambitious biohacking things going on? Where are the gene edited babies? The only one that we know about happened in China and that guy went to jail. What's, why isn't there more crazy stuff happening in different jurisdictions? I, my, my sense is the FDA has a global stranglehold on everything. Um, and it's, uh, it is because there are a lot of different reasons. In, in practice, most governments are not willing to have looser regulations than the FDA. So it's actually, um, so there is less regulatory arbitrage than it looks. And then, um, secondarily, um, the U.S. pays a lot more for this than other countries. And we can, you know, go into all these debates about whether we're paying too much in the U.S. or whether, um, the rest of the world should be penalized for free riding off of it. But uh, if you develop a biotech uh, drug and if you can't sell it in the U.S., um, the economics are mu much less good. And so it's, it's, uh, it's in, in practice, it tends to be U.S. or bust. Do you think that technology will eventually render a larger proportion of the human population unproductive or unable to contribute to the economy? And if so, what should those unproductive people do with themselves? Well, I think, I think the Luddites have, have always, they've been wrong for a long time. Um, there are, there's certainly ways you could probably scare me some with, with, with AI and, um, there, there are versions of it that where, where you, you could, um, you know, you, you, you might, but even if you convinced me that the Luddites were right about AI and that it's actually going to just replace people without, you know, you know, if you were a Luddite, you know, in the mid 19th century, you said, you know, the machines are going to replace the humans. And that was, well, that would be such a relief because there's so much work for people to do and they it would just free them up to do other things. And, and so maybe it's, um, maybe it's less complimentary, more game of substitution. Even if you could convince me of that, I'm still in favor of, of the AI because, um, because my default is muddling through isn't good. My default is, you know, the default is really bad. And so, you know, we're not, you, you don't get to muddle through with Greta on her bicycle. <laughs> Thanks for coming. You've alluded to a lot of the forces between decentralization and centralization, particularly around AI, with forces around the individual. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more, describe what you think the forces could be that stop AI development, particularly as it relates to the state's role or how... Uh, a politician or another entity could co-opt that force for their own benefit versus the benefit of many. You know, maybe, the, but maybe the premise of your question is what I'd challenge is uh, it's, 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 it's why is AI going to be the only technology that matters? And so if, if, if we, if we say there's just, there's only this one big technology that's going to be developed and it is going to dominate everything else, that's, that's already in a way, you know, um, conceding a ver version of the centralization point. So, uh, so yeah, if we say that it's all around the next generation of large language models, nothing else matters, then, um, you've probably collapsed it to, you know, you know, a small number of players. And, um, and that is, you know, that's a, that's a future that I find, you know, somewhat uncomfortably centralizing probably. But, I, I, you know, this is, you know, the definition of technology, um, in the 1960s, technology meant, you know, it meant computers, but it also meant new medicines and it meant, you know, spaceships and supersonic planes and the green revolution in agriculture. And then at some point, technology today just means IT. And maybe, you know, we're going to, you know, narrow it even further to AI. And it, it seems to me that this, this narrowing is, you know, is sort of a manifestation of the centralizing stagnation that we should be trying to get out of. Um, earlier, you mentioned that tech might end up saving San Francisco from itself. AI, AI specifically, yeah. Hey, sorry, AI, AI specifically. Uh, how do you evaluate the efforts of places like Miami and Austin to present themselves as alternative tech hubs, and has that opinion changed over the course of the last two years? 
Well, I'm still very, pro, I'm still very pro Miami. I, I think, I think the Miami story has been more, more of a anti New York story. So it's a tale of two cities of, uh, and, and the finance part of the economy doesn't have to be centered in, in New York. Um, and, um, and, and that alone, I think, you know, explains, you know, a great deal of, of Miami's success. I think the, you know, I think the tech, you know, again, it's somehow we're in a very different place from what people were focused on even two, two and a half years ago. But two and a half years ago, there was sort of much more of a crypto story. And the, um, you know, crypto is a decentralizing technology, but also the companies that were doing crypto were decentralized, not just in the U.S., but there's a decent number of them outside the U.S. And so um, if, if crypto was going to be a big part of the future tech, tech story, um, that would have been a, you know, naturally uh, decentralizing from Silicon Valley narrative. And Silicon Valley had really missed out on the crypto thing in a relative sense. And then, um, you know, I know consumer internet, you know, a lot of this happened in Silicon Valley for all sorts of complicated reasons. You know, it's supposed to get rid of the tyranny of place, but it all happened in one place. And then, um, the, uh, the AI piece seem, seems to be even more centralized in Silicon Valley. So again, if we, if we say that, um, you know, the next uh, decade or two decades are just going to be doubling down on AI. Um, that that probably suggests that uh, you know uh, San Francisco will maintain and in Silicon Valley will ma- maintain or even gain gain in power. But. Hello. <clears throat> First and foremost, I just want to say thank you for guy for coming out and doing this event. It's been wonderful. Um, I have a silly question, and I. I'm going to bring Star Wars into it since we were talking Star Trek. <laughs> but when you, this concept of the world order, it's the first time I've really delved into it and thinking about it. I'm wondering, do you envision a world order that's just like totalitarian dictatorship or just the similar to like there's just too much information, too many countries, too many people trying to vie uh, together <coughs> and that everything just kind of gets lost and that the power isn't really about the people, but that kind of world central, I mean, a global central, like what is that that you envision? Well, I'd like to avoid the first type. Um, and then it's always, uh, yeah, the second one, I, I, I will concede it's, it's a little bit more confusing. And, uh, you know, there's, and so, yeah, you, I would like to have, you know, a libertarian world order of, you know, many nations and you can, you can move between them, um, but and so there's some there's some um, there's some um, transnational thing. You're not completely stuck in a particular country, but then the transnational thing can't be so powerful that it actually controls all the nations. And this is you know, this, these are these are sort of maybe maybe this is just a sort of a paradox of globalization. It's like Hegelian thought is always you know thesis antithesis synthesis. Even if you agree this is the correct framing, the problem is people always confuse. The synthesis with um, a superposition of the thesis and antithesis. So, if we say globalization, some global world order is the final synthesis. Is globalization, as it's described today, just a superposition of you know, the slightly unstable, you know, um, global market, but no global government? And then, is, is, can that can that really be maintained? So, um, yeah. So, I, I, I think uh, there probably are, you know, some paradoxes in my. My picture of a desirable world order that you know one could one could unpack some more, um, but uh, but yeah, if if we have too concrete a picture of exactly what the world order looks like, that's probably really bad. A bit of a follow up to the gentleman too before me. Um, I I understand you've spent a little bit of time in in Miami, so um, at kind of coming down from the macro level um, to the street level, local governance. Um, almost like an economist getting lunch perspective, what is Miami doing well, and what does Miami need to improve upon? Well, there are a lot of things. I, 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 I've, I've been here the last four winters, so it's been two, three months each, each winter here. Um, yeah, there are a lot of things that I think are, are, are going incredibly well. I'm always into these sort of Georgist um, real estate theories where if you're not very careful... Um, all the, the value in a place gets captured by the sort of corrupt real estate group of people. And there's sort of a, Henry George was a uh, late 19th century economist who was sort of like 
sort of socialist then, today seen as sort of libertarian, which probably just tells something about how our society's changed. Um, but uh, but the you know the 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 worry in Miami is that um, is it have we really escaped the Georgia's disaster that is San Francisco that is New York that is London where um, even though there's been a tremendous increase in in GDP you know it's 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 not good if 100 percent of it gets captured by um, you know by by slum lords or something like that. Thanks. Last question. Thanks. Um, so a question about AI and theology. Uh, Voltaire had this great quote, um, if God didn't exist, we would need to invent him or her or whatever the pronoun is. Um, do, you, do you find this view of like superintelligence AI, which might be in the near future, as a kind of deity, as a kind of machine god, is that useful? Is there leverage to that? And it, could it even be more than just a heuristic, some kind of substantive statement? It's, it's sort of a purely theological question. I want to focus more on the political theology question, which would be something like, you know, if, if it's a centralizing AI that's controlled by communist China, will it just uh, be very good at convincing people that um, the party is God or that uh, the wisdom of crowds or, you know, whatever the consensus is, is, is the truth. And, uh, and then, yeah, there are these metaphysical questions where it doesn't seem like it's exactly, you know, I don't know, a transcendent, traditional monotheistic God. But I, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would, I would go to more of the political questions than the, you know, the, the metaphysical ones. And probably the, you know, the risk danger is that, um, there's something, something about it that sort of telescopes even more the sort of, um, you know, Consensus, truth, wisdom of crowds, you know, I, I think probably um, all the models, I, you know, I, I, I will, will tell you that there's no particular religion that's more true than any other one. Um, and then is that really what the models generate or is that, has that been hardwired in? Those are the questions I'd be more curious about. Thank you all for listening to Conversations with Tyler at the Mercatus Center. Most of all, thank you, Peter thank you Thiel. Much. Thank you.